two, three. Uh, society uh, um this uh, broadcast your camera and microphone has been disabled you should submit to the panel using uh, the question and answer box at the bottom of the broadcast window uh, not through the chat if you have any technical issue please close your browser and restart it and the webinar perhaps move closer to your router uh, the society will release a statement following the webinar, which will be a recommendation and conclusion of this uh, uh, meeting. Uh, you could follow the, uh, the, the conference at the SAS, uh, the Twitter account uh, of the society at SAS underscore KSA. So we'll start with our uh, uh, top topics, it's, uh, it's about the SAS protocols for COVID best practicing guidelines and highlights, and highlights. Uh, OB and pediatric anesthesia updates and highlights and recommendations, cardiac and thoracic anesthesia updates and highlights, neuroanesthesia updates and highlights, and finally the highlights on anesthesia specialty role in healthcare system. So our first topic will be the SAS protocol for COVID-19 best practice guidelines moderated by Dr. Fahd Al-Qurashi, which is, who's the chief uh, of division of anesthesia critical care at John Hopkins, uh, Aramco Healthcare and, and consultant of anesthesiologists. And also Dr. Abdullah Al-Harbi, he's a consultant anesthesiologist and chief of anesthesia department at Saudi uh, Security Force Hospital in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. So I'll give the microphone to uh, Dr. Fahd al qurashi to start our first session. Dr. Fahd. Uh, thank you, Abdul Aziz. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, uh, uh, colleague, and uh, welcome again. And uh, thank for the Saudi Anesthesia Society organizing this uh, webinar to go over uh, the guideline and the recommendation. So uh, it is my honor and pleasure today uh, to uh, search the first session, uh, which will be uh, discussing the uh, best practice guideline for COVID-19 uh, uh, done by or presented by Dr. Abdullah Al-Harbi as Abdul Aziz uh, uh, present him, he's our uh, colleague. Uh, anesthesiologist consultant and the chief of the uh, Department of Anesthesia and Security Force uh, in Riyadh. So we'll uh, leave the mic with Abdullah and uh, looking for his uh, discussion and the presentation. Abdullah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum Thank you very much, Dr. Fahad and uh, Dr. Ajaz for the introduction. And thank you for the Saudi Anesthesia Society actually for uh, this activity. Uh, which is uh, actually a continuation to the, the, the great effort uh, that uh, we all have seen and uh, in, the, in the previous uh, uh, conference. So um, this lecture, which is about to share the um, about to share the presentation, is just um, a summary to the previous uh, lecture that uh, I've given. Uh, summarize the recommendation uh, that been uh, provided by the Saudi Anesthesia Society with regard to airway management. Been a great help to uh, most of us in anesthesia practice. And uh, it was uh, actually uh, well uh, written and it covered almost uh, most of the anesthetic practice in, in different uh, specialties. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to add to this one, so this is a summary, but I'm also going to add at the uh, at the end, uh, the recommendation from Saudi Anesthesia Society regarding resuming elective surgery, which is a topic that uh, most anesthetists uh, probably have some question about or sometimes some uh, concerns or a query. So, 
So with regard to uh, conflict of interest, nothing to declare with uh, regarding to the lectures. And uh, probably it's almost now uh, aware of the COVID-19 and SARS, and uh, there is no uh, probably need to um, put any definition even in the community. So the, as we mentioned previously, the Saudi Anastasia Society, they have done a great job actually uh, on, on um, during their uh, special uh, um, volume from the Saudi Journal of Anesthesia, actually writing the COVID-19 outbreak by Prof. Abdulazim Dolatli and Prof. Abdelmoumin, and also the airway management uh, protocols, uh, which was led by our colleague, Dr. Mohammed Al-Harbi and uh, his group. So um, the, the objectives uh, were mainly to provide an update about the COVID-19. Uh, at that time, we're actually, uh, as a clinician, we did not have a lot of um, uh, trusted resources to give us a full uh, or a, um, full review, actually, of uh, what has been published or what has been seen, even in other uh, specialties. And it also to help uh, the practicing anesthetists in, in giving them a guidelines with relation to airway management in patients with suspected or confirmed uh, COVID-19. And they also um, uh, did a great job in uh, describing the recommended personal uh, protective equipment suitable for uh, airborne droplets and contact isolation. So they defined the suspected cases, the probable cases, confirmed cases and contact, and according to the available uh, evidence at that time. And uh, the principles that they followed uh, were purely focusing in preparation. So how can we prepare the uh, personal protective equipment and um, focusing on the time needed also uh, for uh, the um, donning and doffing process and the role of observation. It's having an active observation if with someone watching the uh, uh, colleague while they're uh, donning or doffing. And this is all to maximize the safety. And uh, they also uh, uh, mentioned the minimum number of staff and uh, also having a clear uh, warning signs and proper uh, plan or a detailed plan for the airway management. So if we are suspecting difficult or uh, if the place that we are going to do the intubation is actually uh, like in a remote area or uh, if we have any difficulties. So uh, it's better to have a plan for the devices needed rather than actually um, rushing to intubate and then finding difficulties in the middle. They also um, emphasize it in uh, team uh, dynamics and these guidelines emphasize team dynamics, assigning the roles and uh, um, getting the most expert uh, clinician to lead and uh, uh, the communication and cross monitoring of uh, for uh, any contamination, which is just a continuation to the observation also from the dunning and doffing uh, process. Uh, the environment, uh, they also gave advice about the negative pressure rooms, dedicated areas, pathways, equipment disposal, and uh, HME filters, HEPA filters, uh, all these ones. And uh, the, the patient dispatch, so once we finish this patient, going to ICU, going to a specific area. Actually. So for the environment, so they talk about the negative pressure room and dedicated airway equipment disposal, and the SA, uh, ASA, American Society of uh, any citizen sociologist standard monitoring, this is during the airway management. And um, they um, uh, also mentioned that the expert airway uh, management should be led by the most senior person. And uh, one reason actually to minimize the, the time needed for uh, the, the process of intubation for the aerosolization process. And also uh, for in case of any difficulty, uh, minimizing the persons involved directly with this uh, possible infection. And at lowest possible gas flow to maintain a safe SpO2 rather than having uh, higher flows and also that will lead to more uh, possible more uh, spread or uh, more aerosolization. And um, if we can minimize the leak from the face mask that was recommended and to perform a rapid sequence induction or uh, modified rapid uh, sequence induction if possible. Uh, using video laryngoscopy uh, as a, a process actually uh, to have uh, the advantage of keeping the practitioner away from uh, the, the patient and also uh, it will be one step ahead in terms of uh, if you face a difficulty rather than having the multiple attempts. And um, they advised against fiber optic intubation unless highly uh, needed. 
and uh, positive pressure ventilation to be uh, delayed if possible until the cup is inflated. And that's also to uh, all to minimize the process of aerosolization. Maintaining closed uh, circuits and uh, to avoid any, in, any unnecessary uh, disconnections. And uh, when um, uh, this connection of the circuit is needed, they advise about full uh, PPEs and clamping the tube and the ventilator should be on standby mode. So the disposal uh, resheating the laryngoscope immediately, uh, and that's also to minimize the, the cross contamination of other uh, stuff or, or for the even the um, practitioner, and it should be sealed. Uh, all the used equipment and a double the block plastic bag and sent for decontamination and disinfection. So for the doffing itself, the strict adherence to proper doffing steps uh, in terms of uh, education, monitoring, and high height, hand hygiene, and cross monitoring also. And uh, for the PP itself, so they, they um, mentioned the fitted in 95 mask and the emphasizing then the uh, process of having a properly fitted N95 and uh, what the objective and also the uh, papers or the purified um, uh, devices, goggles, footwear, waterproof gowns, and gloves uh, should all be utilized when you're dealing with the suspected or confirmed cases. Um, so they uh, also uh, not um, uh, stopped at that level. They actually, they went far, so, uh, further in, in um, putting the guidelines in dealing with pediatric uh, patients with suspected of confirmed 19. And it was similar in the principle to the adult, but they um, emphasize also our the guidelines emphasizing IV induction if possible and muscle relaxation to minimize, minimize cuffing and using micro cuff uh, endotracheal tubes uh, should be used and deep extubation. So if we, if we can um, probably see, especially for uh, most of us who don't do pediatric anesthesia on a uh, routine case, we can see probably some of these, not what we do normally. So most of the time uh, we use uh, inhalation induction if the child doesn't have an IV, and we prefer generally to extubate the, the child and then awake. But in this situation, uh, the, the, actually the aim is to protect also the staff and the health worker. So all these measures should be actually uh, implemented if possible. So um, thoracic surgery and lung isolation, there was also a detailed guidelines by uh, Prof. Dolatli and uh, Dr. Han and their group. And uh, they mentioned, uh, uh, so if someone wanted for a reference, it was excellent in terms of lung isolation possible and using uh, different, and using even a suction for the tube. Uh, and it also, uh, there was a, guidelines on ophthalmic surgery for patients with suspected or confirmed N19. Uh, and um, <clears throat> so the, the good thing about these guidelines actually is very comprehensive to the anesthesia surface. Uh, if you look at other international guidelines, probably they did not go into detail. So most of them uh, focused on the airway management. I right? think they, they actually involved the ophthalmic and even electroconvulsive therapy, which I, um, Myself, uh, have been involved in a couple of cases with ACT during the pandemic the peak, and it was helpful also to go back and, and just have uh, some um, uh, guidelines or actually assist me in taking the decision. So ophthalmic surgery, is, there was nothing much about airway management per se, but we were talking about screening and the need for surgery, um, and uh, similar for electrocompulsive therapy and using the mask. So for CPR, there was also uh, Dr. Khan and his colleague, uh, they also um, have um, uh, written an update about the CPR, which is similar. Uh, they emphasize on the use of PPE and covering the victim nose and mouth uh, with a piece of fabric uh, <clears throat> and the rest of the CPR uh, as, as recommended internationally. So, um, their final comment was about the process of preparation uh, de when dealing with airway uh, management in a COVID-19 patient and uh, <clears throat> preparing the PPE, the environment, equipment, briefing the team with the roles and communication and planning dispatch of the, of the patient transfer process and having a process of uh, managed staff and isolation also. 
So um, the the new uh, probably addition to this talk uh, today is just resuming elective surgery. So um, uh, probably a question that comes to us all the time, are we ready to uh, go back to a full uh, capacity for elective surgery? So um, the Saudi Anesthesia Society uh, have published uh, a statement about resuming elective surgery during COVID-19 pandemic era. And I can uh, actually uh, summarize it here. So uh, why it has been published? Because we are aware now uh, from the, the literature that actually uh, people who are infected with SARS uh, or the COVID-19, uh, they um, uh, carry higher perioperative mor morbidity and mortality. So um, there should be a uh, sustained. So they started with the, with the regional actually uh, um, numbers. So there should be a sustained decline in the total number of cases during the COVID-19 for at least 14 days in that area uh, in order to um, resume uh, non-urgent surgery. And um, the availability of mass testing uh, should be uh, considered. So because if you are going to open for um, more elective patient, then you are likely going to more uh, need um, testing for these patient and also for um, uh, the staff who actually get in touch with this patient if you uh, by a chance develop or, or get um, exposure of one of the patient or one of the staff get exposure or multiple staff get exposure to one patient that would tend to be a positive with this testing. So they recommend that uh, PCR screening should be performed for all pediatric surgical patients as well as their guardians. And um, before we consider full capacity, we should uh, always um, uh, revise uh, human power for anesthesia, for surgery, for nursing staff, um, because uh, COVID-19 time has um, its study on all the health sector. And also if you go into a full capacity, then um, there is a chance that for exposure it happened, it may happen. And on that one, say, if you discover by a chance one of the patients who had the surgery uh, tested positive, and then uh, all these staff who were uh, exposed, so what are you going to do with them and with the, with the booked cases in case that you isolate them? Um, definitely, they uh, also mentioned the adequacy of uh, PPE for anesthesia and for surgical supply. So before we move into full capacity, we should have uh, adequate uh, chain supply and uh, we are uh, happy with that. Um, presence of uh, vacant inpatient critical care beds. Uh, so um, that's also something we should consider before we go into uh, capacity because uh, when we go into full elective capacity, uh, some of these procedures, some of these patients might require the intensive care. And um, if um, this might affect the capacity of the intensive care uh, or we have a limited capacity, then we have to um, reconsider the decision of actually um, um, resuming the elective. Um, should have, we should have a planning for surgical pathway with reference to high risk infection. It's either to a non COVID patient or um, the healthcare worker. So, if, if we are opening the elective cases, then there is a chance actually uh, of um, getting one patient that who might be a positive and or even an emergency cases, and then the other patient who are doing the elective surgery. So, how are we going to manage if there is a possible um, um, cross infection or if um, how can we uh, stream actually or divide the patient during this uh, peak uh, capacity when we have a lot of patient coming in the morning and there is a chance of an emergency also who is positive. So it needs a lot of organization and uh, consideration. Um, uh, also, they mentioned uh, the consent, so modifying the consent to include the statement on the risk of COVID-19. So given that we have uh, already, um, we know that there is uh, increased perioperative risk uh, of, in, in terms of morbidity and mortality for someone with COVID. So uh, the patients who are coming for non-urgent surgery should be aware that uh, about this fact uh, it's either uh, the, the possibility of uh, infection during the hospital stay or catching it and also the complication that might happen. So they can, can, they can make an informed decision about the timing of the procedure. So um, they also um, uh, 
classified the cases and they, uh, they um, recommended to prioritize the case to a non-time sensitive surgery where the where the, where the, where the, where the uh, in whom the postponement, postponement until one year will not have a negative impact on uh, the patient outcome. And that's for the pure elective surgery. And uh, uh, on the other side, the time sensitive surgery with a scheduled surgery for patient whom the delay more than one to six weeks potentially has a negative effect on a patient. And these are the, the surgery that um, uh, we uh, probably uh, should go ahead because waiting the risk and benefits. Okay. So the urgent surgery scheduled that uh, must not must be done within 24 hours of the patient outcome. And uh, this is definitely uh, probably out of the question and usually there is no issue with these type of surgery. So uh, no doubt that the final uh, decision should be uh, also um, based on every institution and every regional area where they can take uh, all these uh, consideration into account because it's not only related to anesthesia, let's say, or patient, so we have a, a long waiting list that is accumulating. And also, um, if you open it, there is a, an increase also capacity or increase utilization of testing. So sometimes what's the capacity of my lab and what's the capacity of the center that if I happen how to break during this one. So it's a lot of things that probably some of it related to anesthesia and the rest is um, probably um, and needs uh, collaboration and also uh, administrative input. So the recommendation all selected patients should have a proper assessment trial tool looking for classic symptoms of COVID-19. Uh, so this is just a screening process like uh, if we have any symptoms, headache as well as non-classic symptoms like loss of smell, diarrhea, any history of contact with a positive uh, COVID-19 patient or anyone who actually scored with the high risk uh, with the screening tests non-urgent uh, surgical procedures should be postponed uh, for 14 days uh, before uh, reassignment. So you can see either, uh, they did not recommend for testing. So if it's a high risk with a screening, if the surgery is not urgent, then uh, they recommended just to um, uh, postpone for 14 days for two, for two weeks. Low risk of it with a screening with a negative contact history, then um, they advise to uh, proceed for the surgical procedure, but uh, should have uh, the screening for the uh, PC uh, for the um, PCR testing. All scheduled patients uh, to undergo non-urgent surgery have a COVID-19 PCR preventively, and all non-urgent surgical procedure for patients with a positive COVID-19 test should be postponed until uh, full. Uh, um, recovery. So um, I think uh, this is the main summary okay, uh, for the COVID-19 about resuming the surgery. Thank you, Abdullah, um, for this um, excellent summary and uh, presenting all the guidelines. Um, for the, just to keep the time, I think we're going to move to the next session and we're going to keep the question at the end of the webinar. So uh, we'll um, hand the mic to uh, our colleague Fatma for the second uh, session, Dr. Fatma. Okay, thank you, Dr. Uh, Fahad. Uh, now we'll go to the, our second topic. It's about uh, OB and pediatric anesthesia updates, highlight and recommendation, uh, moderated by Dr. Fatma Damas. She's an assistant professor and anesthesia consultant. Also, she's the head of uh, pain management unit, uh, unit at King Saud University. Uh, our speaker will be Dr. Nasr Tawfiq. He's a section head and consultant of obstetric, obstetric anesthesia at National Guard Hospital in Riyadh. So, Dr. Fatma. Uh, good evening. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome in SAS virtual uh, conference highlighted and recommended webinar. Uh, thank you, Dr. Abdul Aziz, uh, for this introduction. Uh, I would like uh, to uh, welcome all attendees in our session. And just to say that feel free to submit your uh, scientific questions in a Q&A uh, icon as it will be discussed later. <clears throat> uh, please uh, join uh, me in welcoming Dr. Nasser, uh, who is going to update us about uh, obstetric and pediatric anesthesia. Enjoy the session. Dr. Nasser, mic is yours. إن شاء الله يكون الفويس كويس بعد التست كله نبدأ بسم الله الذين يضرون مع اسمه شيء في الأرض أو في السماء طبعا المشكلة إنه all our topics يعني shared together and all these topics 
يو جونا مي فاند سم انفورميشن فكان مره عندي مشكله انه وات ويل بي ذا نيو سو اي ويل تراي تو جيف يو ان شورت تايم اوف 10 مينتس وات دو وي نيد تو نو اباوت كورونا كورونا ستارت تو بي ان بانديميك بات ذا بروبلم is that a just orientation of the situation what's going on these are our fellows who help us to prepare the lecture in obstetric anesthesia i'm trying to advertise for our program okay the bad news guys saras is going uh, rigid and will be more with health walker so it's really a serious things do we really worried about corona because of health walker when we look at the study we found that as a health worker your incidence to have infection is higher by 7% than other it means that every day you come to work you have 7% chance that you're going to get covid if you deal with obstetric you're going to have higher incidence if you deal with the pediatric you have higher incidence our colleague before said we should cancel the cases i can challenge you who can cancel a c section i think it's really going to be a difficult thing to be done Okay, what's the result? They found that uh, the COVID overall epidemic in healthcare worker is increasing and being a health worker will increase your risk of having the infection. So why I brought this slide to give you this bad news, if you are a health worker working in obstetric and pediatric, any health worker, you need to really and listen to the recommendation of our colleague that it's not a game, it's a serious things. Not that only by the way the hospital is bushed to change their system we always talk that we have the best or we have no infection because we think the infection come from our hospital to the patient now we have to have a negative pressure room the infection will come from the patient to upstairs so this is a serious thing make hospital uh, try to force and make the positive pressure negative pressure room with this simple introduction i'm trying to alert you that the situation is serious more than before not that only the corona in the last recent breaking news it tell us that it change its site from 23 site meaning covid 21 if we can call it from 19 to 21 start to be more infectious more serious and then we come back to the basic guys just try to no shaking distance and you try to think that every patient is infectious still proven otherwise again we always think that infection and prevention strategy is an important thing that we need to carry about. I'm just trying to remind you the presence of HEPA filter will not prevent the infection. HEPA filter will make it more because the circles of the air will be more 40 times. It means that the ideal thing is to have an OR with a negative pressure room. And the ideal thing is to isolate the patient. The ideal thing in obstetric or pediatric to decrease the number of the people who's going into the room. So don't try to make more than one consultant go into the room, one person from each specialty. And even if he can be outside remotely will be better. Again, we need to have a managing stra strategy <clears throat> before this patient come to the OR. You need to have a good communication at the beginning. You need to inform the team that this patient and responsibility and uh, coming to the hospital alerted by all the hospitals. So the nurses will operate in certain room. In our hospital, we dedicated one room for the patient to be operated if you have a corona or suspicion. And that strategical things need to be thought more and more. And the precaution should be taken for transferring the infection from uh, the patient to another patient. One opening room should be de de dedicated for COVID as we send the patient, uh, enter and exit the OR should be limited. The visitor will be limited. You're gonna stay with the patient till he done his surgery, no break till you finish. All the uh, precautions that we usually receive and do is really important to take it in consideration. Why? Because it's not a game. Reduction of elective cases. This is a really serious de decision. As we said beginning, and I was really scared when he told me that up to one year, we should make the patient delay surgery. If he, if he get infected and he did an elective surgery, he may have to wait one year. If he is not infected, I think if he come to our hospital or to any hospital, he may get, get corona. And we've seen that in our hospital. Not that only, now the OR management in obstetric or in pediatric, they will ask you to have a higher rapid turnover. This is kind of mission impossible. No, it's gonna take longer. You may only do two or three cases. 
the cleaning precaution, the things that happen between cases is really getting more complex. You need to wait for one hour and a half. Do not use uh, air, air hugger uh, for the patient because you can transmit the infection from the patient to the air. So things are gonna change essentially in our obstetric update because most of our patient or in pediatric have hypothermia during the OR. Now we have to think twice that we should make the room hot, not make the patient hot only, which make it very difficult for our surgeon, which I find it good so the surgeon can finish quickly. Again, we need high uh, quality filters for our machine. Our machine can get and transmit the infection. So having a good department which follow the recommendation with regarding the filter and the breathing circus is, is an issue. Okay, traffic, no traffic in the OR, making sure that we have enough number of N95. All these things is really important to really emphasize. Only essential equipment should be inside the OR, minimize number of necessary people in the OR. The operation set, set up have to be changed, as you know, in obstetric or in pediatric. It means that not all the medication you think and dream of will be inside the OR. Life starts to be different now. You're going to know what you need. In obstetric, maybe you are lucky because you're going to do spinal. No, you are not lucky. Just wait. You're going to know, know more. Again, endorsement team, again, uh, well, and timeout is really important to understand the circumstances of the corona. You may have, I have to highlight that the problem with, as our speaker said, you cannot tell if this patient 100% corona because the corona will stay for at least seven, eight, 10 weeks. It doesn't mean that he shed the virus, but he may test it positive. So you have to treat him like a criminal and you have to continue to treat him like a corona, which make it more difficult for you to work under all these goggles and masks and to think that you can do a better job. Again, uh, exposure and uh, spread, we have to think about our agent. What should we use in our induction agent? Should we modify them? Still, we have the propofol gonna be still the use, the muscle relaxant is the sax or the rocronium or whatever you have is still valid the anti medication, you're gonna bring it with you to reverse the patient, anti-emetic, there is no problem with them, the analgesic, the only thing we worried about the analgesic is the data which came about brofine and so on. So you may cannot give ibuprofen or insider because it get, get the infection worse, but most of our medication will be fine. We will have a challenge with the spinal anesthesia because we don't know if our intrathecal morphine given is good or not. Yes, it's good. The problem, the CCF coming from the corona patient still can be infectious. Some data show us that be careful about the fluid of the patient. And not that only when they deliver the baby that you may expose yourself to the blood of the patient. A question for thought, do you think patient who transfer and give a blood transfusion, he's corona positive and he doesn't know the corona will transfer to your patient. So when you deal with blood, you cannot tell if the blood you give to the patient is a free of corona. I know people will say, what are you talking about? The study show that the corona can transmit through the blood. We don't have a test or the blood to test if the blood test have a corona. We know that it have HIV, it have uh, hepatitis A and B and C, but corona, we are not there yet. So handling the blood can get you risk of having corona or even the patient can transmit corona that make us more conservative in corona time with obstetric and pediatric. Anesthesia induction, not much of a change. I want to finish my 10 minutes because I'm sure that we have a lot of questions uh, to run around. So these things is really uh, advanced, not that only when we get these people sick, they need an ICU and with pediatric, tell me if I can do MRI for him and take him to the MRI to have rule things. So I am again saying to our colleague, if you please don't need MRI, don't make me put corona patient under anesthesia. It's a risk for everybody. And I don't think confirming the diagnosis or confirming the status of the lung will help a lot. So be careful. You may uh, do urgent anesthesia for them and so on. And remote anesthesia maybe uh, make it more complex with these things. Okay, post-operative anesthesia. 
Again, we have a problem with the nurses now. They are so scared that they're gonna deal with a corona patient and even the patient is scared from the nurses because they look scary. So the equipment and the things that you care about and the room and the infection that you, you have uh, in the room need to be really studied by everybody. Equipment and supply gonna be new. You may have your hospital have no enough supply, but recall and rem remind them that the area of recovery room need the supply all the time. Anesthesia supply of the patient deteriorated. Again, the isolation room, most of recovery room have no isolation room. Some only of anesthesia recovery room have isolation room and that make our uh, things more complicated. It means that you may need to recover the patient inside the OR and run uh, the show in the OR will be really difficult and block it for more than four or five hours for one patient. So if you don't have isolation, it means that most of uh, care strategy gonna be compromised and the patient gonna be compromised. Again, management of healthcare worker after caring of the infected patient. You always have a depression after you deal with this patient, let's face this situation. You think you're gonna be infectious. I know some of our colleagues even take a separate room in a hotel because you were to transmit the infection to their lover and their family. So he think that staying at, the, at this place will prevent him, but he forget that the person who cleaned that place even can get infected. We make the problem with the, uh, with, with the people who have a healthcare worker like us having more serious things we don't know if we have corona or not yet. We think that we did not get it, but maybe on the timeline we get it and it went past. Obstetric anesthesia recommendation is uh, like the pediatric. You know the pediatric, I want just to remind everybody when you deal with the pediatric, you deal with a mother which you don't know if she's corona positive or not. She tested negative, but she's with the pediatric for a long time. Uh, again, when you deal with obstetric, I don't have much recommendation, but I will try to pass by if Fatma did not stop me. Again, the screening, do we trust the screening? We don't know. The, the, the mother who is trying to socialize with everybody and visit her everybody to congratulate her for her pregnancy come to you and she did not know that she's symptomatic. Uh, unfortunately, during the COVID time, 30% of our obstetric ladies have a COVID 50% of this 30% doesn't know that they have a COVID and they are asymptomatic, which make us screen every patient who's coming for obstetrics. So our recommendation that any woman come with symptomatic, regardless symptomatic or not, have to be tested because the pregnant woman will not show it because of the high surge of the steroid that they have. Understand COVID, you have 25% of a chance that even if your test is negative, you are positive. If you repeat it, this 25% goes to 12.5. If you repeat it, it goes down to, uh, to less than six. If you repeat it, so it needs that you repeat it four times to know that this person have no COVID. It means that we lost the confidence in our test and we worried about every patient. Not that only the pregnant woman never stay in her bed. She wants to socialize with other pregnant women and she may infect other or get infection from other people in the hospital. Real time, uh, uh, the goal of the COVID testing is just to identify as much as we can. Again, uh, clinical management uh, and PPE is more easier with the C-section because we insist that we're gonna do spinal in them. We insist to cover their faces with uh, N95. We insist to keep them in a different room so we are less likely to get it. But I think in pediatric, you can get it easily and what make me, what I couldn't find that who is the health care worker gonna have more infection than others. What we found in our obstetric division that we have 50% of the obstetrician have a corona already. Again, remember the corona does not transmit only by respiratory conduct as well as transmitted by fluid. It means that when they rupture any fluid, it come to their face. So they have higher chance of developing it so socializing with your colleague in obstetric is not recommended. Now, we think isolation room is, is masked. We know the mask of the patient is important. The visitor have to be restricted. Our life after Corona will be different just for the time uh, constraint. I would like to remind about the case 
series about the, there is an incidence of thrombocytopenia. Be careful that your corona patient may have a platelet disorder that will make it difficult for you to do spinal. So look for it. Again, no ibuprofen for them, which you used to give uh, as a alterian intrathecal morphine as well, the minimizing exposure during urgent uh, things by avoiding uh, the intubation and obstetric. Guys, I really enjoyed the topic, but I have 10 minutes. Otherwise, Dr. Fatma will give us hard time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, shall we go for a question now or shall we wait till the end of the, all of the session? We still have three minutes for questions. Okay. One question. We have one question. They ask about when elective surgery will be done for a people who got the COVID vaccine. I think Dr. Abdullah answered it and said <laughs> up to one year. Thank you, Dr. Abdullah. <laughs> you cancel all. Uh, as a chairman, I think it's a very difficult decision. And I think it's taking case by case and so on, if it's a malignant or not malignant. So uh, I think these decisions have to be done like uh, a committee. Uh, and I think that COVID will last for the next uh, six months or nine months, even if we have zero cases, because we think that even the tests that they announce cannot really detect all the people who have corona as we, as, as we think. But I will give uh, Dr. Abdullah a chance to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ruiz. I agree. I think uh, if the non-elective surgery, uh, so the elective surgery, uh, there is always a recommendation. I'm talking from an acidic perspective. If we can postpone, then uh, that's what's recommended. But sometimes uh, the other factors also uh, play a role. But for vaccination itself, so I'm not aware of any uh, guidelines per se, and I think it's quite early to have it. But um, probably uh, the other principles that we apply in vaccinations. So sometimes, I mean, in the, in the other vaccination, uh, they classify to the like live attenuated and uh, non-live vaccines. But in general, probably they're talking about a one week period. Uh, I think the reason is not safety per se, but uh, most of the time they're talking about actually the picture that might happen after the, the vaccination. So if, if a patient takes the vaccine and then uh, goes to surgery and next day develops a fever, it just um, makes it sometimes uh, challenging for the clinician, is it actually an infection after the surgery or as a side effect? So I don't have a solid answer, but I think it's just probably a safe to say uh, one week if the patient is actually uh, insisting on the surgery and there are other factors that actually uh, push toward uh, doing that elective surgery. Thank you, Dr. Abdullah, for this great answer. We have another question. Is it ethical for, uh, to force the patient for spinal anesthesia if he is emergency and COVID positive? Is it ethical to infect me? <laughs> Simple. So uh, who is the physician, you or me? The physician is me. So I decided the best thing for you is to have a spinal anesthesia. So I'm, I'm not sure why a corona patient want me to go and dive in his lung where it is full of bugs or full of viruses because he doesn't like to see me or to see the baby or to see the situation. Uh, I think the choice of the physician, uh, if you look at the incidence of spinal anesthesia in Canada is 99.9%. .9%. In Saudi Arabia, we give them the choice. And this have to come back as Dr. Dagestani, remember everybody remember that, they have to come to the education. If the people uh, try to use the fine line between line that it's contraindicated to do spinal for a patient refusal, I think we need, as Dr. Abdullah said, we need to revise and put a, a rigid guideline so people will not play with us and say that, no, it's my right to have a GA. It's like, it's my right to take a car 1970 to drive it for, for the next 1,000 kilo because I want the 1970 car. No, it's not your right to to break every one minute and two minutes and to spread the infection and to kill yourself. So uh, Bat Sullivan, I will never forget when he say, a patient sued me better than a family sued me. So make the patient sued me because I bought a spinal better than the family come to sue me because I kill him because he have a corona and I could not make him go through the surgery. 
Okay, thank you, Dr. Nasser. Uh, before we go to our next uh, topic, I just want to remind the audience that for the CME hours, for the people who register with the Saudi Council number, it will be uh, uh, delivered automatically to their account after two to three weeks from this session. So for our next topic, it will be about the cardio, uh, cardiac and thoracic anesthesia updates and highlights. Uh, moderated by Prof. Abdelazim Dawlatli. He is a professor of anesthesia at the Department of uh, Anesthesia College of Medicine at King Saud University. With our speaker, Dr. Uh, Dr. Mohamed Dagestani, he is a senior consultant anesthesiologist. So, Prof. Dawlatli, the mic is yours. Okay, Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdelaziz, for uh, this uh, opportunity. And I also uh, would like to thank the Saudi Anesthesia Society for giving me this opportunity to share tonight with you uh, this interesting topic. Uh, the uh, speaker for tonight is Dr. Mohammed Daristani. Dr. Daristani is a senior consultant anesthesiologist in thoracic regional acute pain service in the private sector. He is course director disaster management and Emergency Preparedness, American College of Surgery. He is an instructor, uh, simulation training affiliated with King, King Abdelaziz University, examiner in the final clinical examination of anesthesia intensive care in Saudi world. Uh, always Dr. Daristani is surprising me by his uh, lectures. I am sure you will learn a lot from him tonight. And also he is uh, surprising me by the background he is creating for his uh, presentations, which at one time, I'll be happy to learn how he is doing it. Dr. Daristani, please, the mic is yours. Um, thank you, Prof. Uh, Dawlatli, and good evening, everybody. Uh, first, I would like to thank you for uh, the presentation, very kind of you. And I would like to thank the Saudi Anesthesia Society for uh, bringing up this, uh, you know, activity back uh, online so we could share expertise and we could share thoughts and uh, information together with our colleagues in different uh, regions and across the, uh, the, uh, the kingdom. Um, I'm going to share my screen with everyone so that we could actually uh, go to the presentation. So um, as a uh, disclosure statement, um, I do not have any affiliation uh, with any uh, commercial organization. Uh, that may or may not directly have uh, connection to my uh, initiative and content of uh, this presentation. Um, I'm just uh, being invited to present this talk uh, about update in thoracic anesthesia uh, in the era of COVID. So uh, moving along, everybody remember this picture in the news when it came up uh, initially which was the World Health uh, Organization declaring the uh, COVID-19 uh, 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 the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, and at the same time, uh, it uh, this declaration have changed dramatically the way we look at things in in uh, in in our. Uh, region and in our society in terms to uh, practice. Now, um, I'm just gonna uh, carry on. Here we go, sorry about that. Now, carrying on, everybody, uh, again, remembers the history. Um, these are pictures of the differences that have occurred in the world, uh, including our holy city of Mecca, nobody ever have thought that at any time the Haram and Kaaba would look very empty like that. And I hope things go back to normal one day, inshallah. Now, um, again, from the history, the 14th International Saudi uh, meeting was conducted as a virtual conference compared to the 13th. 13th, we attended physically. 
it was a nice gathering. We exchanged thoughts and, and discussion. Hopefully things will get back and truly we get back to physically, you know, uh, talk together. Now let us move to the topic itself. And let me just uh, start by few points related to thoracic anesthesia. Commonly, um, we used to teach classically thoracic anesthesia in terms of airway management, uh, tools used for lung isolation. Uh, we classically use the normal physiology as our guidelines between awake and anesthetize, the differences between the lateral position, the uh, blood shunting and compared to the, you know, changes that happens with one lung compares to two lungs. Now, things have changed. Right now, situation is completely different. We have a new pathophysiology that is happening, affecting the whole information we know in relation to lung physiology. The airway management tools and control became a bit challenging because now with the use of uh, preventive uh, devices and the shields and the masks and everything, so it became a bit challenging to properly visualize the airway. The principles that we know about thoracic anesthesia have changed dramatically because now the physiology and pathophysiology of hypoxia is different from what everybody used to know. The tools and equipments have evolved. There is more, more uh, emerging tools in video laryngoscopy and videoscopes and bronchoscopes. And still, despite the knowledge we have, I still believe and everybody have noticed that our knowledge in the field of COVID still lagging behind. The research is still under development. We are still truly being updated every now and then with different information. So what do we know in reality? Now, when I wanted to search and I came across a lot and a lot of publications, surprisingly very fresh year 2020 in the field of thoracic anesthesia because this have caught world by attention. So everywhere you go, just put the keywords COVID-19 and put any relationship to it, you will have a very fresh out of the editor's list, you know, references. Now, that doesn't mean that references is good because in reality, some of them are just repeating some known information. Some are very, very unique based on very strong evidence in the field. Some have gathered by truly experts in the field who have gathered around and issued the consensus of how, you know, such a process uh, for different fields in anesthesiology should be conducted based on experts in the field and general guidelines combining together and putting it to maximize the benefits for our practitioners. So, if I wanna talk about the pathogenesis of SARS and COVID-2, and we know that this is a respiratory disease, so the target organ is gonna be the lung. Anybody who's practicing thoracic anesthesia, he knows that your whole game depends on healthy lungs. Well, when you have COVID, that's not a healthy lung at all. You already have a messed up lung that a lot of things have happened in there. We do know that COVID does affect other organs like the nose and the mouth and you know the mucosal structures. It does have some effects on the sensory nerves, on the olfactory mucosa, you know, causing some drop in uh, ability to uh, perceive smell, you know, different uh, uh, symptoms in relation to temperature regulation in terms of fever and so on, but let's concentrate on the lungs and let's focus about exactly what happens in there. Now, we know from evidence and from review of certain experts in the field of COVID, there is an alveolar damage that occurs. And secondary to that alveolar damage, hypoxia subsequently happens. That hypoxia sometimes go to the extent of causing hypoxic respiratory failure 
which is usually a fatality in many patients. Not only that, but we as well know that there is a dissemination of a huge amount of cytokines and release of inflammatory reactions that happens in the, at the endothelial level, causing a basement membrane injury and causing disruption at that cellular level, which will cause two, two things, cytokine storm and activation of the coagulation pathway leading to microemboli and thrombi, which in turn can lead to stroke or embolism. The cytokine storm, because of the massive release of those aggressive mediators in the human body, it might lead to a shock, which we know as ARDS or multi-organ systemic failure is a common you know, name, but its reality is a bit different in pathophysiology. And a lot in the field have learned that use of steroids does decrease those inflammatory reaction and massive cytokine storm to decrease the injury effects on the human body. Now, let me move further. Anesthesiology have published you know, an article back in October year 2020 describing the pathophysiology at the alveolar level. So when the virus get inhaled through the alveoli, it goes down in the lungs. And in the lungs, we have the type one and type two alveolar epithelial cells. These cells get activated. So the angiotensin converting enzyme uh, receptors get activated with the molecules from the alveoli, the spikes of protein on the surface of the virus, leading to a massive reaction that involves the basement membrane causing disruption and injury at the level, causing some leakage of blood causing thrombi and edema and flooding of the alveolar with fluids leading to hypoxia and pulmonary edema is a reflection when you subject the patient to a chest x-ray, you have a massive inflammatory reaction that happens in the lungs and commonly the lungs have been described as, you know, flooded or wet lungs or, or a massive, you know, inflammatory reaction that affects both uh, lung uh, uh, bilaterally. Now, let me move across and look at the acute respiratory disease syndrome and the management that happened across the years. Since the year of 1995 until the year 2020, several trials have been published in the literature. Some of them have been shown to be of benefits. Some you know, uh, kind of uh, not truly very effective. And if we look at it, the red line here, intervention shown to cause potential harm. So we know that the heavy dose methylpyridinazolone and omega-3 and the rovastatin trial was not truly of any benefits on those patients. Now, up ahead, we have intervention that likely have no clinical benefits or it has mixed or intermediate results. And you could see the dexamethasone is among that group. So not truly, really, we could judge and say it is not effective, but it's questionable now. Every part of physiology of diseases are different. We know in COVID patients, some patients who received dexamethasone, the response were variable and there was some of them, there was a drop and a decrease in the acuteness of the inflammatory reaction. Some of them were saved even the uh, need to intubate and mechanically ventilate and support their respiratory pattern. Just to have a look on the top line and we could see the prone position and everybody who worked in intensive care unit in the last month since the pandemic and since March, we know that prone position was very useful in those patients. It is labor incentive for sure. It does require a lot of manpower. It is very exhausting. Uh, on top of that, remember everybody is wearing his protective, personal protective equipments. So it is very, very labor 
in, in, intensive and it is very difficult. It does have, and it shows benefits in oxygenation, and that's why it might be one of the tools and utilities that have been used try to optimize oxygenation in those patients. Now, let us look at this graph here. And we are talking about, you know, oxygenation and the hypoxic ventilatory response. Now, classically, we've been teaching that the hypoxic ventilatory response do kick in whenever hypoxia starts to happen in the human body. It's a, it's a normal, uh, triggered by the carotid chemoreceptors due to the decreased oxygen saturation in the blood. That mechanism is modulated centrally and it affects the shunting of the blood from areas that are not perfused to areas that are perfused. So we have a, an effect that does affect the VQ matching part try to optimize the VQ matching part, and in turns, it does improve the hypoxic effect on the body. Surprisingly, in COVID patients, it was noticeable that a lot of patients, though they have developed low level of oxygen saturation, but their response did not trigger those compensatory mechanisms. And some of them, they even developed a sort of an adaptation part that actually does accept and no physiologic changes in the pulmonary dynamics and the respiratory pattern to equate the level of hypoxia that happens in those patients. Some have looked into this in deeper look and they started to try to simulate physiologic response that's related to high altitude versus hypoxia from COVID. And they saw a lot of similarities between those you know, conditions. Not only that, but they went even further into aviation medicine. And they started to look into the literature and they started to look into the process that happens in aviation industry at high altitude when the oxygen uh, partial pressure is low and hypoxia occurs, what is the human response to that? We know that as a compensatory mechanism, usually you start to develop the hypoxic response together with hypercarbia and hypercarbia will stimulate the release and decrease the affinity of the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve and it's gonna shift that curve towards the right side. So uh, there is less affinity for oxygen to catch the uh, uh, hemoglobin to catch oxygen and oxygen will be released more towards the tissues. Now, in COVID patients, that's kind of undergo an adaptation phase because there is a noticeable hypocapnia, not hypercarbia, but hypocapnia that occurs. And that is one of the things that have been observed because of that, the usual response to hypoxic ventilatory response and the dyspnea perception and the tachypnea that accompanies normal hypoxia with respiratory failure does not occur. And that explains why that some of those COVID patients, when their oxygen saturation at room air is 80 or 85%, or sometimes down to the 80, they do not show any pattern of distress except very late. At that moment of time, the dramatic crash is precipitous that those patients have no room of compensation. And that's why they go very quickly into crash and collapse because of hypoxia. Now, let's talk again. What do we know about COVID-19? Sorry, sorry to interrupt you because uh, before the time constraints and to keep it sure. uh, on time, sure. five minutes you have more, please. Absolutely. Now, uh, I'm, I'm glad because that was the main theme and this is what I wanted to highlight physiological wise. Now, what do we know from our scientific knowledge in 
about COVID, it is an aerosol generating, you know, medical uh, procedure that's for thoracic. We know that we need to deflate the lung. We need to do lung isolation techniques, which does carry a high risk for SARS and COVID-2 transmission in the atmosphere. We know that the OR are positive pressure rooms. Already Dr. Nasser have talked about it. So we need to make sure that all anesthesia team wear the full PPE protection on those patients and disposable tools should be used for intubation. I'm gonna quickly run through these slides so you know that those protective PPE is not the easiest at all when you're using it inside the OR. Positive filters everywhere to protect our machine, to protect the patients, to protect the staff. This is very crucial, very important. And if you notice in these pictures, we do even put filters at the site where the lung is going to be deflated. Another picture will highlight that very clearly. And as you can see, we put filters everywhere as the arrows show so that we can protect ourselves and patients. Again, the same thing, we need to protect everyone around us and by applying those filters. If you're using the uh, bronchial blockers, you apply the same tools. Disposable fiber optic scopes are available. So after the procedure or during procedure, you could use that and you could get rid of that. Now, this is an algorithm that is available. I recommend everybody to look at it. It is at the European Society of Thoracic Anesthesia. They have published this algorithm. It is very clear. You could just follow the pathway. It show you how you should deal with patients when you want to deal with thoracic anesthesia. And with that, I come to an end. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. And I would like to leave more room for discussion and questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed. And uh, I think uh, Dr. Abdelaziz, shall we take questions or will, uh, what do you think? Now we'll go to the, inshallah, to the next subject. Okay. Then we'll click the question at the end, inshallah. Uh, our next subject is regarding neuroanesthesia update and highlights, uh, moderated by uh, Dr. Man Qattan. He's the chief of anesthesia at King Abdelaziz Medical City in Jeddah. And our speaker is Dr. Rizgal Amri. He's a neuroanesthesia and pain management consultant, uh, East Jeddah Hospital. So welcome both, and uh, Dr. Man. Thank you, Dr. Abdelaziz. Uh, um, uh, I would like to thank, first of all, the society for um, um, arranging this uh, webinar. Uh, second of all, I think uh, in the next 20 minutes, Dr. Rizgar Amri uh, is going to talk about uh, neuroanesthesia updates. Um, he's, uh, as, uh, as you said, a neuroanesthetist and a pain management consultant in East Jeddah Hospital. He did his training uh, uh, initially at the Saudi board and then eventually had a couple of uh, fellowships in uh, University of Western in London, Ontario, and as well as McMaster in Hamilton in Canada in pain management and neuroanesthesia. And without further ado, he's going to talk about uh, mainly the perioperative uh, stroke and the management related to anesthesia. Okay. <clears throat> uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Mann, for your nice presentation. Uh, uh, I would like to um, thank the organizing committee. Also, uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Abdelaziz Ajaz and Prof. Ahmed uh, for uh, inviting me. Uh, so I, I will go through the uh, slides. I will share it now. Okay. Slides are shared now. Okay. So uh, our talk tonight is about the CZ update. So. Uh, um, uh, first of all, I've uh, disclosed that uh, there is nothing, um, no conflict of interest throughout my slides. Um, so um, we're going to concentrate on this update regarding the preoperative stroke. So I'll try to avoid the talk about COVID-19 and was really uh, interested uh, uh, lectures, uh, lectures throughout we, we heard uh, tonight. So preoperative stroke is one of the uh, main topics that have a uh, new update in neuroanesthesia and uh, through uh, this presentation we'll go over a view, literature review and current recommendation. So uh, as we know, stroke is, has uh, um, found that uh, it is the second leading uh, of mortality in, uh, in patients since about 16% uh, of death uh, 
causing a lot of disabilities in general among neurological disorders and leading to also disability for life, uh, accounting for 45, 40, up to 42 uh, disability related to life. So when we talk about perioperative stroke, we need to understand that the, it is um, any, um, the infarction or the ischemic or hemorrhagic um, um, stroke that happens um, during the surgery or within uh, uh, or after uh, 30 days of the surgery. So uh, stroke has, has been known that is catastrophic. It has been associated with uh, mainly um, uh, undergoing for the um, non-cardiac and uh, non-neurological surgery associated with eightfold increase of most mortality. Unlike a stroke in community setting, the mechanism of stroke in the um, preoperative time is discovered and uh, associated with highly predictable origin, which is the surgery. So patient is going to the surgery and then the patient uh, develop um, a stroke. So um, given the fact that surgery and anesthesia, and anesthesia associate with increased uh, stroke comparing to non-surgical group. Um, and we know that the preoperative recommendation could mit minimize the risk of uh, stroke. So we know through the time that even with our colleague from the cardiac uh, anesthesia, that the study of stroke um, with the, uh, within the cardiac um, surgery, especially those uh, surgeries that interfere with the heart and uh, intracardiac uh, uh, surgeries associated with increase of the uh, post-operative stroke. But if we go to the risk factors, and we know that there is uh, predisposing comorbidities and perioperative events that is associated with, with, uh, with the uh, risk of uh, stroke. So, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and add to that the high risk of surgery, especially vascular and non-vascular uh, uh, and cardiac surgery. So uh, this is an overall uh, incidence of uh, preoperative stroke throughout the different age group. As we see, um, it has been uh, studied from, um, uh, from early uh, life till the um, up to 100 years. Uh, as we see the incidence of the um, non-cardiac uh, surgeries are uh, increasing with the, with the time. So whenever you have an aging uh, patient going to the surgery, the non-cardiac, non non-vascular uh, surgeries are getting higher incidence of stroke in each group. While the uh, early age group is associated mainly with uh, transplant, neurosurgery, and, cardiac, uh, and cardiovascular surgeries. So um, the awareness of um, stroke and the preoperative uh, for uh, patients are, uh, for non-cardiac, non-vascular surgeries are um, started in 2019, sorry, 2009, where the um, uh, a review of around uh, uh, 371 patient, thousand patient, the, these files or these patients, we found only a 16, um, hundred patient with associated with a stroke. So the issue is it, uh, are we detecting um, appropriately the perioperative stroke or we have um, more, or uh, this is this uh, similar number that we have it. Um, and uh, that uh, led to um, a trial that was uh, started in 2013. Uh, the, they call it a Neurovision trial. And the Neurovision trial was actually a prospective cohort study that uh, done uh, um, within 12 academic centers, and uh, it was targeting to study at uh, 65 year olds uh, patient or older that going for inpatient elective non cardiac surgery, and they had brain MRI after surgery. So uh, there, there was two independent uh, neuroradiologist expert mask the clinical data associated with that um, they studied the MRI or acute brain infarction and they are um, leading to uh, diagnosing the stroke that are uh, uh, seen in the MRI. So the primary outcome cognitive uh, decline. So any patient that they have a uh, change in their cognitive, they are included in the, in the um, trial and the, they use the Montreal uh, Cognitive Assessment as part of this uh, that uh, trial. So, um, um, the interesting factors that the study uh, was uh, uh, early 
published in 2016 that they found 10% of patients that they are including in the, uh, in the study, they have uh, covert stroke. The covert stroke is an acute cerebral ischemia, even that is not clinic clinically apparent. So the patient will have cognitive decline, motor impairment, um, some, uh, which can lead to dependence and death. Um, and this is the uh, um, pictures of the MRIs that has been shown in the patient that they have uh, changes in their neuro and um, in their um, cognitive, most operatively, and they found that there was um, a covert stroke. So their finding actually uh, to us, um, uh, they published a trial in 2019, uh, and that they found uh, 1,114 participants, including the study. They found 78 uh, patients that they have a peer operative stroke, which is uh, going to about uh, 7%. So among those uh, patients, they are uh, they studied, they found that there is a cognitive decline one year after the surgery in those uh, patients, which is the uh, 78, uh, around 42%. And this is lead to more uh, interpretation. And they found that there is a one in 14 patients, um, age of uh, 65 or older, they have a uh, covert stroke. So what are the gui current gui guidelines for this? Uh, so the timing of the surgery after stroke is very important. Um, if the patient are, uh, have had stroke uh, within the three month pre-operatively, uh, pre the advice is strong not to proceed with elective surgery and you should stabilize the patient up to nine months. Um, so the consideration of delaying the patient up to nine months is uh, class two or eight. Also, the, if the patient is anti, an anticoagulant, that we need to uh, uh, stop uh, vitamin K, uh, uh, like warfarin, uh, medication five days preoperatively, class A. Um, if the patient is uh, having a higher incidence of uh, uh, um, um, cardiovascular insult, that we need to go with bridging um, for those kind of patients. Um, we need to stop uh, anticoagulation um, in one to three uh, days preoperatively, resume it um, one to three uh, days postoperatively, and, uh, and the decision is, should be uh, clinically uh, related for every patient. So we need to study every patient and to see whether the patient is um, indicated to proceed with the bridging or not. So our, if the patient is anti uh, beta blockers, so um, the evidence is against um, beta blocker initiation at the time of the surgery. So whenever you have patient is already in the beta blocker and the statin, please continue it, but do not um, start the patient in beta blocker at the day of the surgery. Uh, so interoperatively, uh, the comparison between um, general anesthesia and neuroaxial uh, we had uh, three uh, studies look to the incidence of uh, stroke um, um, uh, at the uh, level of the uh, patients that are going to the general surgery versus uh, neuroaxial. And they found that in two studies that there was no uh, changes um, or there's no aesthetically uh, significant difference in stroke. But in, in, um, um, in the last study, we see that they had... Um, there was an uh, increased incidence of stroke on the patient that going for the um, for general uh, uh, through general CC. Um, and the, they found that it's more related that the patient in those group that are going to the uh, uh, orthopedic hip and knee surgery that they are usually uh, higher in their um, age or they're uh, older. So inhalation versus Steva. Uh, actually, there is no difference in stroke compo uh, comparing volatile and of to the non uh, uh, or the TIVA patients, and so you can uh, be uh, you can proceed with any of these uh, the patient are uh, indicated to do uh, general CC. So um, nitrous oxide, as we know from the basic signs, that there is association with plasma uh, hemocysteine uh, concentration that leading to impaired and to endothelial uh, functions. Um, at which is uh, theoretically increased the incidence of uh, cardiovascular incidence and also related to 
tissue plasminogen activators, which is leading to uh, increased hemorrhagic uh, complications. So um, um, in Enigmas uh, 2 trial that they found there is no associations between uh, nitrous oxide and interoperative um, and post-operative stroke incidence uh, in both in, uh, patients that they have uh, nitrous oxide. Um, recommendations uh, for a patient that are going for the elective surgeries. So you need to go with regional anesthesia if indicated, um, if applicable. Um, if not, you cannot go with the regional anesthesia. You cannot. So the, the aim of regional anesthesia is actually to monitor the patient. Uh, so whenever, whenever the patient is awake, you could you could uh, evaluate his, his uh, him neurologically. Um, if not, you can proceed with uh, anesthesia. So both the TIVA inhalation can be used without any problem, and uh, nitrous oxide is safe across the surgical populations. So um, what is the recommendation of blood uh, pressure uh, measurement? So um, the aim of it, uh, um, you need to maintain the patient uh, adequate uh, perfusion and blood pressure from his baseline. Um, uh, so the uh, incidence that you need to go with reducing the stroke uh, on those patients that associated with hypertension. So whenever you have hypertension, please treat it. Um, and the recommendation is also whenever you have a patient going for elective surgery like shoulder surgery that you're going to use uh, beach chair uh, position, please uh, um, try to avoid um, uh, prolonged hypertension without any monitoring for cerebral uh, perfusion. So uh, uh, what, if, what about the um, respiratory uh, physiology? The recommendation is to go with normal capnia. So we know that hypercapnia will get increase the cerebral perf uh, perfusion. On the other hand, hypocapnia will lead to uh, decrease the cerebral perfusion. So please, uh, if, um, if you could keep the patient uh, normal capnic and those patients that they have higher risk of uh, cerebral, cerebral vascular um, uh, compromising. So in the patient that they have uh, or they are bleeding, uh, they have higher risk of um, um, of stroke, as we mentioned from earlier, uh, keep the pa keep the patient hemoglobin uh, above nine, and this is will lead to uh, avoiding the uh, complication related to that. So um, um, this is um, a recommendation that we, we we need to go for. So what about the glass uh, the blood sugar uh, management? Uh, avoid tight uh, control. So um, please keep the uh, um, the uh, uh, blood uh, sugar is between 130 to 180. And whenever it's higher than that, you need to treat it. Don't target lower uh, uh, blood sugar. Interoperative beta blockers, as we, uh, the, the current evidence is that metoprolol is associated with preoperative stroke. So um, if you have patient that indicated to give beta blockers, you should, uh, we should avoid uh, giving metoprolol, we, we should, Think about short acting like ismolol or uh, other uh, um, uh, beta blockers that is, uh, has um, uh, both either beta and alpha uh, associations. Five minutes, doctor. Okay, and the uh, post operative uh, guidelines. So, uh, so the assessment of stroke is very uh, important. So, whenever you have a patient that is at high risk of stroke, go uh, uh, vigilance regarding the assessment and uh, proceed with it whenever you have. So um, uh, acute interventions is very important that to, uh, if the patient is diagnosed with uh, stroke, uh, we should in initiate the uh, multidisciplinary approach and to uh, reduce the, uh, the um, complication related to it. Uh, if you have patient that they have uh, or they developed uh, uh, signs or symptoms of stroke, please uh, proceed with uh, um, imaging uh, CT should be done for those patients. Um, baseline uh, ACG is very important. Uh, if the patient is at uh, risk of um, vascular insult, stroke, uh, we need to keep those patients in cardiac telemetry within uh, the first uh, 24 hours of the incidence. So whenever we have patient with um, a high blood pressure, we need to treat it, especially for above, whenever it's above 180, even if those patient has a sign of symptoms of uh, uh, stroke. And uh, this is also the 
um, aspirin should could be uh, used uh, within the 24 48 hours it's highly recommended um, and the aspirin should be delayed until the last 24 hour patient that they have IV uh, alteplase and also we need to keep saturation of uh, 94 uh, as we, we mentioned earlier intraoperatively proceed with uh, aeoglycemia with a target of 140 to 180 milligram per deciliter. So this is a recent publication of uh, Neurosurgical Journal of Neurosurgical Anesthesia. I couldn't um, adopt it because it's uh, uh, published um, um, uh, two days ago. So I would recommend um, uh, neuro or um, um, non-frequent uh, neuroanesthesiologist or uh, uh, general anesthesiologist that, uh, doing um, neurosurgery to go through it. They mention a lot of uh, things related to the uh, current evidence. And also, um, I would, I'm happy to share it whenever we uh, throw my email. Uh, it also mentioned the, the um, uh, current uh, neurological uh, symptoms associated with COVID that is, might be masking the other neurological symptoms. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Risk. <clears throat> uh, we'll move on to the next session, I think, and we'll receive the questions at the end of the okay. webinar. So our next session, inshallah, it's the highlights on anesthesia speciality role in healthcare system in Saudi Arabia, uh, moderated by uh, Prof. Ahmed Abdul Momin. He's a professor and consultant in anesthesia and critical care medicine, and also he's the president of the society. Also, uh, speaker Dr. Mohammed Al Harbi, uh, he's the chairman and consultant of the Department of Anesthesia at King and National Guard Hospital. Also, he's the head of the scientific committee in the society. So, Prof. Ahmed, the mic is yours. Yeah, Bismillah ar Rahim, Alhamdulillah. Thank you, Dr. Abdul Aziz, and thank you for all our moderators and speaker for tonight for the uh, rich, uh, uh, rich uh, uh, information that they are giving us. And uh, actually, we're gonna uh, the, our last session. We're gonna talk about the, uh, about about an uh, anesthesia role uh, during pandemic. Uh, of course, uh, we're gonna start first with Dr. Mohammed Al Harbi, uh, and uh, and then I will uh, I will continue after Mah uh, Dr. Mohammed. Dr. Mohammed, please. Thank you, Prof. Ahmed. Uh, thank you, uh, Prof. Ahmed. I think uh, we are really happy to hear all of these uh, great lectures uh, done by our colleagues. Uh, what we will really uh, close this webinar is by the two things that are really important in the practice of anesthesiologists, especially uh, during the pandemic. I think uh, everybody already um, uh, heard all the information that has been uh, generated uh, for all the role of Saudi Anesthesia Society, uh, providing all um, the guidelines and the practice change that has really developed over a short period of time. Uh, uh, and that was uh, the most important part that we uh, have. Dr. Ahmed, can you just move to the yes. second slide? Curious. Uh, can you, yeah, okay. So the anesthesiologists are really important in any institution. Um, Next slide. Okay. You see it? Yeah. Uh, why? Uh, uh, Dr. Mohammed, do you want to share your uh, your presentation or? Uh, I oh, uh, shall I share? Shall I stop sharing now? Yeah. If no, you can start sharing, please. Okay, sure, sure. It's already sharing, Kelly. Go ahead. So the role of anesthesiologists are really important. 
why the anesthesiologists are important in any institution. I think uh, very clear uh, the anesthesiologists are very knowledgeable. Uh, they have a great background of medical and also the surgical or very operative uh, information. Those are really giving you a combination of an uh, excellent and confidence in the patient care. Um, the second part is the typically are the uh, skillful. They are combined of an uh, excellent skills combined with the knowledge. It will really generate uh, the ideal uh, for uh, a physician who can manage a critical patient. They are also leaders by their character. In the operating room, the anesthesiologists are the most important uh, leader, uh, taking care of the patient, also in any things that related to patient care or at the physician, he is the one leading uh, the uh, care. Also, they are available all the time. Uh, rarely you will find any operating room running without an anesthesiologist. And that's what you really have. And the anesthesiologist is always available uh, day and night. We'll move to the next slide. During pandemic, it's very clear. The role has been developed uh, very well uh, based on, um, of course, caring for emergency and urgent cases like a cancer patient, also airway governance. Uh, they are uh, the most expert and they will not really repeat what's most of our colleagues they mentioned before. And also the expanding role of the anesthesiologist to cover the intensive care unit and opening a new area uh, to uh, meet the demand on the patient for COVID cases. Also developing an, a rapid response team. This is, has been really a major role and we'll discuss it in the next few slides. Next, for the emergency and urgent cases, as you know, by its nature, those cases has to really run. Uh, most of the anesthesiologists are the frontliner in the perioperative care. Uh, they usually, during the pandemic, uh, are all the cases are really continuous. Any institution, they do have their emergency room running all the time and the anesthesiologists available and uh, typically those patients considered as a positive for a COVID-19 till proven otherwise. And the uh, first liner, of course, the anesthesiologist, especially doing a general anesthesia, intubating, managing the airway, and also any procedures related to the patient care uh, will be done by the anesthesiologist during that time. The use of paper and N95 was very essential and has been really planned very well. Most of the institution, uh, they got this early, especially in the very operative area, anesthesiologists and surgeon, they should have those because the infection risk is really high. Many challenges really did happen, like an early communication and planning and execution has to be done by the anesthesiologist to manage those critical who are really highly susceptible or suspected to be an positive uh, cases for infection. Then the airway management. Beyond the role of the anesthesiologist in the operating room, uh, they typically move to an, a more advanced uh, help in the airway management outside the operating room. Uh, new area has They are really going, showing a sign and symptoms of a rapid deterioration of a COVID. They will really require a mechanical ventilation and mechanical ventilation uh, need an intubation and those patients really need to be the most expert physician who are the anesthesiologist to do the early intervention. Of course, this will reduce the multiple attempt and also reducing the aerosol generating infection exposure. And that's why it's really a more burden on the anesthesiologist 
to lead this uh, management of the airway in the whole institute or all hospitals. Most of the institutions, especially in Saudi Arabia, also in the Gulf or internationally, has been reported a lot of planning for the airway management. And as usual, uh, some countries, they don't do have the PPEs or N95, and this make it more even challenge outside the operating room. There is many modification in the routine intubation by avoiding bag mask ventilation and using a video laryngoscopy mainly to be away from the patient uh, and the risk of infection will be reduced. And the Saudi Anesthesia Society really develop a great uh, practice guidelines early on and has been practiced by many institutions uh, and they really out and they follow the algorithm which really give a clear, safe approach for the airway management. Then the intensive care unit and its role was very clear. Overwhelming infection, if you see in the Europe, uh, the infection rate is almost a thousand on a daily basis. All the hospitals are really full. They require some of them a mechanical ventilation with a range of two to 10% of the patients and all the, operate, the ICU are full, uh, opening an operating room run by anesthesiologist was the most essential to overcome uh, the has cannot be really met without the help of anesthesiologists to run independently intensive care unit. And that was part of the important role in, for the anesthesiologists to really do. Uh, it was an extra effort, extra work, uh, opening a new ICU run in, uh, by exclusively by the anesthesiologist. And really the most of the outcome study showed an excellent result in fact rapid extubation for those patients running uh, or the patient in the ICU run by anesthesiologists. They are the most expert in early extubation if required, middle of the night. They have no, uh, not afraid of doing that. And also into early intervention if required and early decision maker. And this is make a huge difference in our institution and I'm sure most of the institution the operating room and the recovery area has been used as an intensive care unit for a mechanically ventilated patient uh, and difficulty typically when the crisis happen. Uh, of course, not many area is available with a negative pressure, but the use of the HIPAA filters and other precaution make those uh, successful uh, journey for our patients. The last, which is the, probably uh, one of the most important thing is a rapid response team. Rapid response team is, uh, is as you know, in a crisis situations, uh, many hospitals develop an, an, a rapid response team like any disasters, uh, in any situation. Back of the COVID was one of the most uh, vulnerable disease during 2020 and and of course, the challenges happen to all healthcare system uh, that there is a disaster. The uh, healthcare will have to be really leading this. And when it comes to an institution, the institution only has uh, a physician to come this by their skills and you're read, leading this rapid response team and this rapid response One thing will be done completely. Patient will require a resuscitation. Uh, they will be done by that, like in a code blue teams, uh, but it's in an isolated area. So they put in 20, 30 patients in one area and that will, the rapid response team, they will be responsible for that and they will have a great effort to manage those patients. And as, as I mentioned, the team, the team are led by anesthesiologists and there uh, has been many reports in the literatures that uh, those are very successful stories. As you know, limiting the personnel to two to three, uh, highly skilled 
uh, avoiding an exposure of the uh, other health team members to uh, such an infection. So this is a typical scenario of the most extra efforts. There is many things in the literature uh, has been published and uh, if you see from China, from Europe, from North Americans, the role of anesthesiologists during the pandemic in China has been really reported very well and shown and a great effort of the anesthesiologists specifically all other healthcare workers during this pandemic. And if you see the other literature review also as a, uh, the changing the future possibility and the practice of anesthesiologists as a very operative uh, physician plus caring for outside the operating room, opening safe intensive care unit areas in case in the demand and uh, anesthesiologist based intensive care we could have just a few slides for a literature review and we will go from uh, this is another one, critical care during corona crisis, reflection and the role of anesthesiologists uh, in the pandemic. Uh, again, the second one. I think I encourage all of you to review those and we can share it with all of you, uh, those type of uh, cases and uh, editorial report uh, and during the pandemic role of anesthesiologists. This is really a typical one of the best uh, review article, which is the value of anesthesiologists in a COVID model for our future practice. Things has really probably will change. Um, with that, I will really mention some few points uh, that issue arising during uh, such uh, a pandemic. It was uh, very exhausting. Uh, long working hours, potential for a burnout, and those are really essential for healthcare system. They deserve more as anesthesiologists. I will not go through more details. I think I will leave the Professor Ahmed to talk about those really issues arising from the work during those pandemics and even before that. And hopefully we can read to and to some recommendation uh, that the higher authorities will be really uh, uh, help to uh, eliminate such uh, issues in the future. Thank you, Professor Ahmed. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, uh, as as Dr. Mohammed said, actually, it's um, uh, as we can see, anesthesia practitioner they are like everywhere uh, in the hospital. Uh, in the, they are in the uh, covering ICU. They are in the OR doing. Uh, uh, they are uh, they are doing uh, urgent surgery and emergency surgery. They are. In recovery doing uh, uh, overflow from ICU, they're in the rapid response team, they are in the airway management team. All these issues, no doubt, uh, made a huge load on anesthesia practitioners uh, that uh, a concern of a stress and burnout may raise, uh, may raise. And, and there are like a, a lot of concern that uh, physicians, uh, especially the acute care physicians or including anesthesia for sure, they are highly, um, highly uh, susceptible, to, uh, susceptible, susceptible to, uh, to stress and burnout uh, during their practice. So uh, it will not, uh, it, it, gonna, it, gonna, uh, it may involve uh, all practitioners, including male, females, young and, and older uh, experience with, with or less experience, but nobody is immune against such uh, a concern. But we have to, uh, to define uh, I would differentiate between stress and uh, and the burnout. Uh, stress is the uh, when the the individual's ability to cope with and deal with the demand is exceeded, uh, and actually in some time uh, such a stress is highly needed in order just for uh, for the practitioner to improve his or her performance. On the other hand, the burnout is completely different. In the other, is completely different story. It is a syndrome. Uh, characterized by depersonalization with emotional exhaustion and loss of sense of achievement. And it is, uh, it, 
it is secondary to the continued, continuous excessive stresses without uh, time or space for, for recovery. Uh, having said that, we, ha we have to know the exact uh, um, difference, uh, symptom signs that happened with the stress and uh, burnout in order for us uh, just to, to diagnose ourselves uh, if things uh, will happen and in order just to, to make our, ourselves uh, in a much better situation. In the stress, we, uh, usually we feel over-engaged. Uh, our emotions are overreactive and uh, we, it, it, it will give us a sense of urgency and hyperactivity and uh, it may lead to some of the uh, anxiety disorders and we may, need, we may feel some physical uh, abnormalities. In the other hand, the burnout is different, is disengagement completely. Uh, we are, uh, uh, people are feeling blunted emotions. Uh, they, are help, uh, they are helpless and hopeless. Uh, they, lose, they lose their motivation and ideals and they, 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 they are so emotional and they, just, they will not proceed to any further uh, uh, reactions. Uh, of course, uh, there are many reasons why stress and burnout may arise, especially in, in, in our uh, specialty as anesthesia and, uh, and, and physician. So a lack of control of work environment, this is a very important issue and we're gonna talk about it. Strained uh, professional relationships, work overload and predictability of the work. Also the admin responsibility that we may uh, do uh, plus our clinical duties, uh, teaching responsibilities, um, peer review, potential litigation that we are always feeling that maybe somebody will complain against us. Uh, disturbance of our sleep uh, rhythm, uh, conflict between our demand uh, of the work and the home. Uh, of course, no, no doubt, uh, personal and family illnesses, um, other social issues, uh, including fin financial concerns. All these issues are reasons for uh, stress and uh, burnout. And uh, uh, there are more people, they are, uh, more susceptible, uh, they are more, have more risk to have such, uh, to develop such a syndrome or such a, a risk, uh, including a younger age of group that they are, they are, or they are because they are less professional uh, experience. So they have less time to develop effective strategy for dealing with occupation and stress. Also the female are reporting that they have higher uh, incidence of burnout comparing to the men. Um, the social background of uh, of the person or, or the individual individual it may it can be a, a risk factor. Um, a social isolation in both work and home will increase the risk of burnout. Uh, the uh, coping str um, strategy uh, we mean by that uh, we they are either negative uh, strategies or positive strategies. Uh, negative, uh, negative, uh, positive strategies, including uh, doing uh, exercises, meditation for sure, uh, having uh, a proper social network. These are protective against uh, developing stress and uh, uh, burnout. In the other hand, uh, negative, including the use of um, and uh, of alcohol and, and illicit uh, substances, are also uh, usually, especially in the in the Western population. Uh, associated with higher risk of uh, burnout. Um, also, the, the personality uh, feature of the individual having a high, a high indicator of uh, whether a patient will develop a stress or burnout easily or not. A, 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 a individual who are like stable and, and difficult to change, usually they are, uh, they, they are uh, immune uh, to develop such thing. On the other hand, unstable uh, personality usually they are easy to be stressed and usually easy to, to have um, a burnout. And, uh, also the, and, and these are what, what I talked about it was, was individuals a risk factor, but we have also an organizational work related uh, risk factor that to develop uh, such a uh, risk, uh, including um, work-life imbalance. Uh, so this is very important issue that uh, spending more time at work 
it will lead to less time for personal interest, family, and, and the time for recovery. Also, also lack of control. And this is what anesthesia and other uh, acute care medicine uh, they, they, they are facing. Uh, inability to, uh, to control uh, our, our own time uh, because our, we cannot control our schedule, our assignment, uh, the workload, it depends on the surgical uh, list and um, the assignment on, it depends on something uh, on somebody else. Uh, lack of resources needed to perform satisfactory liver also can contribute to the burnout. And this is very important issue because um, um, the, we the, the weakness in, in clinical achievement usually associated with high risk of developing uh, stress and a burnout. Uh, people who are, uh, who are co uh, clinically competent, usually they are, uh, they are at, at uh, more immune of to, to develop uh, such a risk because they know, they know themselves and they can, uh, uh, they can prevent it. Uh, also, the workplace and colleague culture and dysfunction. Also, these issues are very important. It can happen, including racism and inequality of work distribution lead to such uh, development of such uh, uh, syndrome, which is the, the burnout. Um, um, having uh, said that, uh, it is very, uh, it is, we should know uh, what are the effects of such uh, such uh, a stress or such a burnout on uh, on uh, on on us uh, for individual for individual uh, level uh, usually the stress and 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 burnout usually it's uh, it it may lead to an anxiety and psychiatry disorders uh, it may lead to a depression uh, absenteeism. Uh, substance abuse, obesity, and decline in working in working ability. It may lead, it may lead also to some uh, some appearance of uh, psychosomatic manifestation, non cardiac chest pain, palpitation, shortness of breath, um, bowel upset, dizziness, headaches um, in form of tension headaches, and other all can appear uh, during uh, such uh, a, bear, a burnout. Uh, the individual uh, about the patient uh, themselves, uh, usually, usually the patient who are uh, cared after uh, a burned out uh, and uh, physician or a stress physician, they have uh, usually they, they express uh, less satisfaction uh, of, of performance in, uh, of, uh, of care. Also they have, uh, uh, they have increased risk of uh, developing medical errors and, 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 uh, and court uh, litigation. And uh, for the institution, the effect of the stress and the burnout, uh, uh, usually the institution will, will, will they have to support or to replace a burnout out physician. And this is uh, no doubt an, an extra uh, cost. Also, there, there are less time for a proper uh, quantity uh, working hours. And also usually they are, uh, they are, they are uh, disharmony and dysfunction uh, uh, between the healthcare team members, uh, leading to more uh, more uh, medical errors and uh, side effect complication on the patient care. Um, all these issues uh, it can happen very easily uh, if we if we did not uh, uh, diagnose ourselves or take care of ourselves. So how we do, how can we deal with such a burnout? Uh, uh, there are like many ways to uh, to do it, and so the the easiest way is just to re to re uh, to remember the three R's in burnout: recognition, reversal, and, and resilience. Uh, talking about uh, recognition, uh, the recognition is the it's gonna be, we, we, because uh, people should know uh, themselves, and uh, if there is any change from the normal. Um, from the norm or from the routine uh, behavior or personality, uh, um, especially in, in such a level of profession, professional level like physicians, they should know that they are at the edge of developing a stress or an over stress or a burnout. Uh, so they should recognize that and they should uh, see, uh, seek uh, help from, uh, from the health expert um including either their uh, directors or their uh, chairman or to the to the occupational health uh, department in their in their institution uh, 
uh, also uh, the directors, chairman, and uh, other uh, administrators, they should take care of their uh, employees and they should know about uh, whether they are uh, uh, to develop such, uh, such uh, um, uh, burnout or, or stress and they have to, to try to, to solve it as soon as possible before uh, things gonna negatively affect uh, the patient care. And, uh, and also the, the institution themselves, they should, uh, they should build up an infrastructure uh, to fight such uh, development uh, of burnout or stress. Um, um, after the recognition, we have the reversal. And uh, my, my next uh, slide, will, um, I, will, I will talk in detail about the reversal. And, um, but, before the, uh, and, but, but before that, I will talk about resi um, resilience, which is a very important issue um, uh, during uh, its, its, uh, its, uh, its, uh, its protective uh, before recognition and even after recognition. Uh, we should we should enjoy our time. Uh, we should we should enjoy that we are taking care of our, our patient. We should enjoy that we are successful in our uh, career. We should be, we should enjoy that we are um, providing services to the others, and we should enjoy that we are physicians and we are um, we are in the top of the of the academic um, in the in the academic uh, in our in our in our academic career. All this issue will, will make you resilience to, to develop such a syndrome. Uh, we, have to, we, have to ha we have to have the, the attitude of a proper communication uh, with our colleagues, other uh, junior, senior colleagues, uh, but the paramedics, uh, the non-physicians. Non, non, non we have to have a proper communication with all of this, with all this staff in order just to, to have very positive uh, personality and, and attitude. And we have always to uh, to act in a positive attitude. We have to always uh, think about something good that may happen after uh, uh, during during that I'm taking care of such patient. Um, this resilience are are very important step in order just to make uh, to make a proper life of your own working life. In uh, other hand, uh, how to prevent how to reverse and how to prevent such uh, such uh, uh, such a complication of your uh, your your professional career? Uh, it, it is either and at the personal level or at the environmental uh, level. Uh, at the personal level, uh, every one of us have he should have some um, uh, some his own spiritual um, practices, uh, including. It depends on, on, on himself, and he's the, he's the only one that he, he should tell himself what to do in, uh, uh, in the spiritual uh, level uh, to improve his, uh, his life. Uh, have to have to have uh, proper exercises himself and to have a proper dieting in order to, uh, to have proper lifestyle. You have to have hobbies outside the work in order just to time for recovery uh, after working hours. In the other hand, we should we should not forget about what the institution should do, what the, uh, the departments uh, should do. Uh, the, uh, the department and the institution they should recruit extra staff all the time. We should not uh, let our uh, uh, our staff uh, feeling short, feeling stressed, feeling that they have to do uh, more 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 of the work. One person can do uh, uh, two three wo uh, work of three persons like a super a superhuman uh, physician. No, this is not right. Uh, allowing ad um, adequate risk between the shift and the uh, uh, calls also, this is very important, especially for our uh, trainees. Improving uh, work uh, place communication between different parties, uh, a surgeon and anesthesia, uh, surgeon and, uh, uh, sorry, uh, anesthesia and, and nurses, uh, front desk, all th sh should have a, a, a proper communication. Also, we have uh, we have to have a proper uh, academic career counseling and training and credentialing in order just to, uh, to feel people uh, push the people to feel more confident uh, clinically and academically. Also, to improve the laws and regulation uh, in the hospital. Um, also, having uh, healthcare, uh, uh, having uh, uh, occupational uh, healthcare uh, uh, clinic. Also, in order just to diagnose and treat 
and uh, counsel uh, uh, risk uh, uh, risk uh, individual that they may develop such uh, syndrome. Um, all, the, all these issues, uh, sh we, we should take care of it in order just uh, not to develop a serious, a serious uh, outcome of our uh, very busy life, clinical life. Um, these are some of the references and that uh, it may help uh, uh, to read. And also I'm happy to uh, send one of, uh, any one of you that he, he need the, these things. Uh, by this, we're gonna reach to the conclusion uh, and uh, highlight. And uh, so I will, uh, I will uh, invite Dr. Mohamed Al-Harbi to, uh, to comment please on our SAS summary yes. and hi highlight on our role in healthcare system. Thank you, Prof. I think it's a great uh, eye opener. Uh, I just reassure you that uh, uh, during the recent uh, studies, uh, burnout, uh, anesthesiologist is not number one, not number two or three. Uh, he is uh, one of studies four and the other one is number six. So there is other speciality. They do have high burnout, uh, burnout and stress also in their life and their work. Uh, but it's a really eye opener. We have to consider this in our, uh, like a chairman's division head to look on this and take care of their uh, colleagues. So uh, we will not take long. The recommendation is really, we must say that we are really proud of all of you. Anesthesiologists are the backbone of any healthcare facility. Very clear role during the pandemic everywhere nationally and internationally anesthesiologists are the most reliable and the most important part in this plan that is for planning in the future. The expertise for the anesthesiologists in medical and surgical patient made them the really the uh, best uh, clinic and during a crisis. Healthcare facility should reach into an, a very safe, effective and cost effective uh, management of the patients. I think this is the most important thing that we're really highlighting we're really proud of all of you uh, to be anesthesiologists and continue your work. And Professor Ahmed, I think, has some also um, points, please. Yeah, and uh, uh, thank you, Mohammed. And as we said, that we are at risk of to develop uh, such uh, a stress and burnout syndrome. So we should take uh, should take steps in order just to prevent developing such risk. Also, the healthcare facility, they should take steps, positive steps, in order just to reduce uh, such risk. And this risk, as we as we sum, uh, we're gonna summarize it in to develop an anesthesia team con uh, concept in the OR, in, in, in where we are, uh, that uh, anesthesia team uh, con uh, consists of a consultant plus an assistant. Uh, this assistant, including a, a resident or uh, or a staff physician, uh, in order to uh, to reduce the amount of stresses that we may face during uh, patient care. Also, we have to have a, a, to develop uh, a plans for continuous professional development uh, for different uh, level in our career as a consultant, as a, as a junior, as a senior, as a resident, as a trainees. We have to have a, a proper plans for continuous uh, professional development. Also, the institution, they have to limit the extended working hours and to implement working hours law similar to the other specialties, including uh, emergency uh, emergency uh, uh, physicians, emergency uh, medicine physicians, in order in order just to prevent uh, anesthesia from from overwork. And as we can as as we can know, um, when when ER physicians they finish the, sh the shift, they just do the handover and and we just they just leave uh, leave it to the other shift. On the other hand, in anesthesia, we may stay in, in our OR uh, covering uh, long surgery. It may be from 8, uh, 8 a.m. morning till, till 10 p.m. Uh, evening. So 
who gonna uh, make the difference in this working hours. So this is, we should, we should have a steps in order to limit such uh, working hours. And um, we have to have also uh, uh, enough manpower coverage uh, reaching to the st standard of the international um, uh, ins institutions, one operating room for equal to one to to uh, to one point five consultant in order just to have uh, to uh, to compensate for the for the vacations and for the sick leaves, and um, also we have to encourage and we have to uh, to have some scale for uh, proper financial compensation and incentive like an overtime and have a proper salary scale uh, in order just to make people more, satisf uh, more satisfied and, and to, work, uh, to work without fear of, uh, uh, of stress and, and burnout. And uh, by this, uh, I think we have reached to, we, uh, to the end of our uh, 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 presentations. Uh, including uh, our our previous five uh, five uh, sessions, and uh, really I want to th thank all my colleagues, uh, and also and want to thank uh, my, uh, uh, for all the attendance for attending. Uh, hopefully, and we uh, uh, we we added some uh, positive and uh, uh, of benefit points to uh, to our attendees. I will leave the the, the mic for Dr. Abdul Aziz and. Uh, uh, if um, to uh, uh, to proceed, Dr. Brazis. Dr. Brazis. Okay, Dr. Brazis. Uh, I think he is. Uh, uh, maybe there is a problem, a technical issue. I'm gonna stop now sharing. Uh, I think uh, we have to thank everybody for the questions. Uh, yeah, we have many questions regarding CME hours. It's two CME hours. Uh, has been um, it will be a credit for all registered and uh, speakers. And there was a question regarding, uh, I will need from the panelists a uh, question to you. Um, there is a question that emergency room, they, any patient suspected COVID, they will call anesthesiologist for a difficult airway. What shall we do? Dr. Dagestani. Uh, thank you, Mohammed. In fact, um, uh, probably you already touched on that. And in many hospitals, uh, uh, the most expert airway intervention is the anesthesiologist. You know, in those patients, you want to minimize traumatizing the airway. At the same time, you want to minimize the uh, trials for intubation in those patients. That's why I believe the anesthesiologist is the best person to do that. And I'm sure uh, same in my place and many other places, we have formed a, a team that is called an acute intervention airway team, which consists of the on-call anesthesiologist and uh, accompanied by a, a technician who is more familiar with airway tools. And those team is usually the person who responds to any call in ER. Um, those patients are usually kept in the negative pressure room. So by default, before in entering into that room, you will be assigned the protective, uh, you know, a personal protective equipment devices, uh, the tools and everything. And you proceed into that room. Uh, the aim and the target always is to minimize the aerosol generating you know, maneuvers, at the same time, minimize the intervention part and secure the airway as fast as possible. So I, I do acknowledge and I do, uh, you know, uh, admire all of our young uh, colleagues and our senior colleagues who got involved in the care of those patients. I'm personally, myself, I was involved in, in many patients. One of them was uh, a very difficult, uh, you know, uh, patient who uh, was morbidly obese. His BMI was 65 
and he had a, a, a standing, you know, hypoxia, and we did an awake fiber optic patient on him. And this is just an example of your expertise employed into action. And I, I agree with that totally. I, I think I, I agree with that, especially in such a situation, we need the most expert uh, person to, 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 to interfere uh, with the patient. We should not leave it for the trials and errors. Yeah, no doubt. Um, also, uh, and I, I have a question, uh, and uh, I have just read it from the Q and A box. Uh, I will, I will uh, direct it to, to Dr. Abdullah Harbi. Uh, the question is, Abdullah, is is it better to designate one anesthesia machine to be used exclusively for COVID nineteen patient, either confirmed or suspected? But but before Dr. Ahmed, let me answer the question. Uh, I think you know, we should increase the chance of exposure for people to intubate and not to wait to, to have a COVID or epidemic where we don't have time to intubate all the hospital. So the expertise in ICU, the expertise in ER, the expertise have to improve. Now we've seen a lot of people who have zero basic background of how they don't know what the vocal cord look like. And accepting this responsibility to be done by the best people have unfair situation that number one, you cannot cover. Number two, you have infection for all anesthesia departments, you cannot do anything. But I think we should readdress this topic and even make a conference. And no uh, airway is a shared sign should be done by not only anesthesia, by most of specialty. Sorry, Dr. Abdullah Harbi, I know you allow me for this interruption, but you, uh, both Harbi know I cannot stop. Go ahead. <laughs> That's all right. Thank you. Thank you for uh, me. And I, I agree with regard to that. Uh, I mean, uh, part. I understand both perspectives. I'm commenting in the previous question because it's a very complex question, and it, it comes to me daily. I think, and I think most of the manager or, or the chief uh, probably they face it. And there is no uh, right answer, I would say. I mean, yes, I think we have the, the duty to uh, provide the best care to the patient. And we believe in a seizure, they have the, the, the best uh, probably training. But again, um, how much resources that you have in the department to cover all these calls? Because sometimes you'll find that the patient is actually not evaluated at all by any other specialty and was just labeled difficult and someone was just called in. So it's a matter of, uh, of balance sometimes actually, uh, what is best for the department so it can function properly and help other patients and what is uh, probably in the best interest of that specific uh, patient. So it's, it's always hard actually. And probably the best approach is readdressing this one and opening. And sometimes if we have a lot of, uh, I mean, probably it's hard to say it's common, but I have seen it probably more than in the past that we are having uh, a lot of speciality that actually they're trying to move away from managing the airway, although they are actually critical or they have training in airway like emergency or ICU. So I think it's something need to be really readdressed on, on uh, from both sides and uh, reevaluated. With regard to the anesthesia machine, uh, so I, I think the recommendations and uh, probably most hospitals that um, uh, during the, the the peak of the pandemic they assigned a negative room with the anesthesia machine and also even the video learning scopes. It's all in in one room, so it's just to minimize the cross infection or spreading infection. That the problem that, so it was easy at that time, the problem now with most hospital moving toward actually the post-endemic era and trying to expand. So we have noticed that um, uh, some hospital, they eliminated that negative room and they just um, uh, kept it that if there is a, a suspected patient, then we have to take the precautions for that one and 10 on hyperfilter. So I think if you have the resources, if you can allocate room, it will be advisable. Um, uh, from our side, uh, I think that standard precautions and also having, if you have someone suspected, even if it's not uh, the, the machine itself, the cleaning, sending the, the, the part of the ventilator to the CSSD after any suspected case, I think that's what I would advise. Thank you. Uh, Aziz, if you have... Uh... Okay. Uh, 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 Mohammed, uh, do you have any uh, anything you, you want to add? Uh, 
I would like to thank everybody for this great uh, meeting and hopefully we can, uh, uh, to everybody, all the panelists, we will summarize those recommendations and uh, it will be really uh, forwarded to the higher authorities. I think Saudi Safety Center and uh, also Majlis al Baman Sahia also that will be included in the uh, recommendation. Um. Um, again, yeah, thank, uh, thank you, everybody. And um, as Muhammad said, we, 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 we're gonna, we're gonna inshallah, publish a recommendation out of this, uh, which is uh, uh, gonna be the summary of our, uh, and uh, summary and highlights of our uh, recommendation, bin uh, ta'ala, to the higher authority uh, in Ministry of Health and others. Uh, I um, want to thank uh, all of the people who is uh, thinking out of the box this 2020 and 2021. Really, uh, anesthesia society is different this year. Whatever changes you guys make uh, to make all these participants come, more than 500 participants come to here uh, at night and, and second and third activity, really, inshallah, people need all this education. I don't think they're coming for the CME. They're really uh, hungry to hear from uh, a society which is under uh, the dark for a long time. Uh, shedding the light on the society by such uh, events and these things we really encourage and uh, we hope it continue not every month, even every day. Uh, and thank you for all the people in SAS who is doing the best work, which we don't know them. But really, all the panel, I would like to thank them from Jeddah, from Riyadh, from Dammam, from everywhere in the kingdom, tell them that what you do is really uh, appreciated. Okay, thank you, Dr. Nasser. And I also would like to thank everybody and for the attendees to attend. And inshallah, we'll see you soon in further uh, educational conferences. Uh, thank Knud Rutaj for this conduction of this meeting. Thank all the moderators for uh, helping us, and inshallah, we'll see you soon. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and uh, it's my pleasure being part of this uh, uh, gathering. And uh, Prof. Ahmed and uh, Dr. Muhammad, thank you very much for uh, looking after the well being of, of the anesthesiologists in the kingdom. Thank you very much, and, and we do appreciate that you do uh, highlight those you know, points very well. And we do appreciate that uh, this consensus is going to go to the authorities in, in, a, in an official format. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.